What up, Dr. G? How's it going, man? Just uh, just really enjoying that last podcast we just did. So yeah, we just had Tom Tom Schroeder on, the Tom Schroeder. And how did you, how'd you feel about that conversation? Uh, I just want to apologize to the listeners for how sick we both were voice-wise. Like we just came, we had so a touch of the plague. You're saying that you caught Ebola before we did the podcast. We, had a, a t- we uh, were one of the 30% that survived. And you almost died. <laughs> We almost you, died. you almost died in in the recording of the, the mid podcast. podcast. We were <laughs> <laughs> well about uh, to keel over and die. Well, you know, Tom was gracious enough to lend us his time. He he definitely seems like a pretty busy guy, and he's working on some different stuff. So um, we were happy to have him on, right, Doctor G? We were pretty happy to have Tom Schroeder. Yeah, if you guys look into it, I mean, we touch mostly on his newest book with the acid test and a lot of the psychedelic research that's going on especially like the maps institute but he's got a whole body of work including like things concerning uh past lives he has a whole book on he's a very interesting dude i think yeah he's two pulitzer prizes yeah so very cool cat yeah yeah overall it was uh very it was shorter than i like to usually go but um hopefully you guys enjoy this we definitely did tom schroeder is is certainly an amazing person and uh this is this is a great episode so um Check it out, and uh, Dr. G, hopefully you don't die. <laughs> God <laughs> And, <laughs> and uh, we will see you guys next time. Tom Schroeder has been an award-winning journalist, writer, and editor for more than 30 years. His book editing projects include two New York Times bestsellers. He conceived and edited the story Fatal Distraction, which was awarded the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. He also edited and contributed to Pearls Before Breakfast, which was awarded the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for feature writing. His latest book is Acid Test, LSD, Ecstasy, and the Power to Heal, a fascinating, transformative look at the therapeutic powers of psychedelic drugs, particularly in the treatment of PTSD and the past 50 years of scientific, political, and legal controversy they have ignited. Welcome to the Human Experience, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Your book and you, the style of writing that you use is, is pretty interesting. I, I really liked uh, kind of reading it. Um, yeah, I wanted it, you know, I wanted it to be, you know, what, what I found was that the uh, story of this, um, the development of psychedelics as a therapeutic tool could be told through the lives of three people, really. Um, and they really link all the way back to the beginning and, and bring it all the way to where we are now. And I wanted it to read more like a novel than a uh, some kind of textbook. Cool. Yeah, you definitely have uh, the word you use. Like, uh, if I can, on your on your website, I found this really amusing. It says, "I I know how you feel. <laughs> I'm sure there are writers who don't find writing to be a bone crushing." nausea-inducing festival of self-loathing. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't happen to be one of them. Right, that's true. <laughs> well, there were there were moments when I was writing this book where uh, my wife had to, like, scrape me off the wall, so. <laughs> oh, okay. That's pretty standard operating procedure for me. Let, me. let me, I'll just give you the stage, and if you could go through... The first chapter in your book, just kind of explain for the people who don't know what LSD is, the discovery that, that Albert Hoffman made and you know, the bicycle day. And that would be interesting to hear your perspective. Uh-huh. Well, I, I mean, Albert Hoffman is a fascinating character. And there's something that is has never been pointed out as far as I know. But when he was a boy... Uh, he was walking through the woods in Switzerland near his home, and he had this moment of spontaneous transcendence where suddenly he had this experience of a sort of a greater reality, um, the sense of unity with everything in the universe. And this was so meaningful to him and yet so hard to express that he really felt that he wished that he could be a poet or, or, or a painter or something to convey what this experience was. And then he realized very painfully that he wasn't a poet and he wasn't a painter and he wasn't an artist of any kind. So he kind of did 180 degrees and became a scientist. And the real irony of the thing 
is it took him from sort of not being able to express this as an artist to a position where as a scientist, he actually found a substance that actually delivered those experiences. It didn't just describe them, but delivered them. Mm-hmm. And that's one of, I think that's one of the 20th century's great ironies. And um, what happened was that he was, you know, the, he was looking for uh, a substance that had some kind of medical use. And he was hoping, based on previous compounds that were similar, that maybe this would help uh, stimulate respiration or, or blood circulation. Right. And um, so he was going, he, he was taking the basic ingredient that they knew was active medically, which was lysergic acid, and adding different elements to it. And in his 25th attempt, he added diethylamide, which was a, uh, it was a uh, derivative of ammonia. And, you know, nothing really happened. The, the, the people in the lab said, well, it has some activity, but it's not as good as stuff we already have. So basically, it's a washout. And for some reason, this one compound stuck in his head, and he called it an odd presentiment that there was something more to this. To the point where five years later, in 1943, he went to his lab and decided to resynthesize this. And he called it, and it was in the lab notes, it was called LSD-25. Wow. Um, And so he did, and as he was doing it, he began to feel funny. And he, he, to the point where he needed to go home and lie down, and he had these like sort of visions and these uh, weird colors and stuff. And... And he, so he went in the next day and he said, that was really strange, but he didn't think it could be the LSD because he had been exposed to such a tiny amount of it. He didn't, it was like hundreds of times less than any psychoactive chemical known. Right. So he didn't think it could be it. So he, he like thought maybe it was the uh, formaldehyde that they'd been using in the lab and he like intentionally sniffed that, but nothing similar happened. So then he, he sort of came to the conclusion that it had to be the LSD, and he intentionally took what he thought was a very tiny amount of it. And that's where you said he had this thing where he had to leave because he felt that he was maybe going insane. And only his lab assistant knew he was doing this. And this was in the middle of World War II. Right. So they didn't have access to a car. So in order to get home, they both had to ride bicycles. <laughs> And he said he felt like he was he felt like that he was like frozen in time and that the more he pedaled, he didn't wasn't getting anywhere. But that uh, his lab assistant later said that, no, they made very good time and they got to his place and he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know if he had poisoned himself. He thought maybe he was going to die or go crazy. And uh, and they called a doctor. And all his vital signs were normal, and there was nothing wrong with him physically, physiologically. Maybe he had a slightly accelerated heart rate or something. But he had this amazing experience, and then the following morning, he felt like the whole world was new. And he went in, and he realized that he had come upon a really remarkable discovery. Um, So anyway, they began sending this out to uh, researchers around the world. And at first they thought, in the initial sort of uh, letter that they sent out with it said, you know, maybe this creates a, a, uh, a short duration um, psychosis and that maybe it would be useful for psychiatrists to experience this so they knew what their psychotic patients were going through. Well, what happened was people started self-experimenting with it and they had experiences that were more like Albert Hoffman's experience of childhood that were revelatory and that they didn't at all feel crazy. In fact, they felt like they were tuned into something, uh, uh, sort of a higher consciousness and a higher intelligence and had remarkable experiences that were very meaningful to them and that remained meaningful after the effects of the drug wore off. And so a, a researcher, he was actually a, a med student at the time he first took LSD, but he became a researcher. 
um, a man named Stan Groff began to see its potential for use in therapy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, before he was done, he had done thousands of um, sessions with, with patients, uh, therapy sessions. And what he began to believe was that the, um, that the LSD uh, basically gave the, the patient access to what was happening in his subconscious and the issues that were most important at that time. And so that it, it kind of naturally brought up the things that the person needed to deal with to, to resolve whatever kind of psychological or emotional problems they were having. Wow. That every session, they came up with exactly the right material that they needed to work on. And they also had, because of their heightened perspective, they were able to have insights into these issues that helped them to unravel them. And he, and this was replicated in, uh, you know, thousands of patients around the world. And from the early 1950s through the 1960s, um, this was seen as a revolution in psychiatry. And, um, and, it was being used with great success for a wide range of things, you know, from autism to alcoholism to drug addiction to depression to anxiety to um, traumatic stress disorder. And it was being used in a, in a remarkable variety of things with terrific success and under clinical conditions with a remarkable amount of safety consider, considering the potency of this drug. And... Um, and it got to the point where um, it suddenly got out into the into the public, into the and, wild, into the wild, and was being used on the street, and uh, and it freaked people out. It got associated with the um, political movement, the anti-war movement, the and anti-authority in general, um, and it really threatened the people who made the laws. Uh, to the point where they just stomped on it. They made it as illegal as heroin, and they stopped all research. And, of course, all these laws did very little, if anything, to stop the illegal and uncontrolled use of it. But it was extremely effective in wiping out all research. And as one researcher said, it was almost as if psychedelic drugs were undiscovered. <laughs> and, in fact, by, you know... As the years went by, the general public almost completely forgot that this drug started out as being a tool for a very successful tool for psychiatry. Hmm. Most people don't even know that. And um, and the story in acid test, really, I tell, is of the small group of people who couldn't live with the idea that we were writing off this incredibly promising kind of. Uh, therapeutic um, aid forever and against huge odds and incredible bias they basically labored for 30 years to get to the point where we are now where it's once again being tested under um, FDA approved in FDA approved clinical trials and again no surprise to the people who had followed this all along it's having really remarkable success in dealing with very difficult uh, issues that are not successfully treated by many other therapies. What's fascinating is that how um, a lot of the antidepressant medication was supposedly founded from the LSD research with the early serotonin rece receptors, the neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but in fact, the whole um, science of the brain really started with LSD because um, at around the same time, just after Hoffman came across LSD, which, you know, had this huge um, transformation on perception and awareness, um, they discovered that this compound serotonin, which had been known to constrict, be in blood, to constrict blood vessels. Um, but they were surprised to find that it, there was very large amounts of it in the brain, and they had no idea what it did there. And then they suddenly noticed that the uh, chemical structure of serotonin 
was extremely similar to LSD. And then the light went off in their head and they thought, oh my gosh, you know, this is something that has an effect on the thinking. This is the serotonin is a, is a compound that is involved in the way we think and feel. And so that was really the beginning of brain science. And that was also um, inaugurated this era where they began to use other psych psychotropic medicines in psychiatry. And, um, the, the, but as it emerged, you know, these antidepressants and, um, and anti-anxiety drugs, they all um, affect uh, the, the neurotransmitter systems in the brain, just as psychedelics do. But the thing about the way they use is that those drugs treat on an unconscious level. If you take an antidepressant, you're not aware of any, I mean, you might feel things, but it's not like you're thinking about your problems consciously. Right. And with psychedelics, the healing comes because you, everything's being brought into your awareness. And what healed, and it's not like, um, you know, like in penicillin, if you have an infection, you take penicillin and completely blow your level of awareness, the penicillin kills the infection and then your wound heals. But when you have a problem and you're doing psychedelic therapy, what happens is those problems are brought into your awareness and you are actually aware of the insights that are the key to sort of unraveling these psychic tangles that have caused your problems in the first place. So you are very aware of the healing and in fact, your awareness is what's doing the healing. It's not the drug. It's the drug is enabling this heightened awareness and this heightened access to um, what's going on in your normally subconscious part of your thinking. What do you and, think that heightened access is? Do you think that's some access to some kind of hyperdimensional realm or some other kind of um, universal consciousness that's being tapped into? That well, the, I, I think. I think. Well, the the simplest explanation is the one that Aldous Huxley sort of came up with way back in, in 1958 when um, he, he took mescaline and he thought that he saw not a altered reality or not a, a kind of, um, a, you know, hallucinatory reality. What he thought was he was seeing reality <laughs> in its entirety for the first time ever. And what he decided was that the normal function of normal consciousness is to tune out much of reality to kind of it's a filter because you know the idea that being that reality is too big too awesome to sort of go about our daily business <laughs> of survival without this distraction of this unbelievable sort of you know literally mind-blowing reality that's out there that is the true reality and that so we've learned to um use our brain to kind of tamp down, you know, it's like in a camera where you're letting in less light so you can focus on something. Well, that's what he thought the brain did was that it kind of tamped everything down and, and tried to screen out stuff and keep things in sort of manageable categories so you could go about your daily business of, of doing the hunting and the, and the gathering, et cetera. And, and that what the psychedelics is was it shut down that, that filter and it allowed the, you know, full sort of magnificent, um, overwhelming awesomeness of reality in, which if you were doing it in a situation where you were safe and protected and you were under secure circumstances, that could be incredibly valuable because, you know, there was a lot to learn from reality that we normally screen out. Um, so I think that actually there's new fMRI research that's going on that is kind of showing the same thing. What it's showing is is that you know originally they thought um, it made sense to think because of the such a because the psychedelic experience is so centrally big, you know it's so sort of loud and, and colorful and, and you know bigger than life. Um, they thought that it must that the psychedelic drugs must increase brain activity. But when they did fMRI, what they found was, no, it, it reduces brain activity. So how can that be? Then what they realized was that the parts of the brain it reduced 
were the, the parts of the brain that um, that screened, that sort of ordered things, that that sort of um, created that construct of, of ego. And it diminished that, which meant that the parts of the brain um, that received the raw input from from the outside world were left unfettered. And and so again, I mean the, the FMRI stuff went right in with that idea that that psychedelics, what it does is it shuts down the reducing valve on your brain and allows in a, a much sort of fuller and, and uh, richer reality. That's fa- that's fascinating. So so do you think do you think that do you think that through this sort of, re- I mean, Rick, Rick Doblin, I guess, uh, founded the hippie in the woods, as you call him, right? Yeah. Um, he, he founded the MAPS Institute and all of the work that they were, they were doing there. I mean, it, it really took a long time. And well, I mean, Doblin is just one of these, you know, great American originals, um, totally self-invented, uh, you know, he he was he he was basically a college dropout who actually at one point went to his father like halfway through his freshman year in college and said, "You know, look, I'm having these LSD experiences that I'm finding very difficult, but I feel like they're important. And so what I want to do is I want to drop out of college and go out to California and study LSD, and I want you to support me while I do this." <laughs> yeah. And what I say, you know, what I say in, in, in acid test is, you know, it's like maybe one father in a hundred thousand would say, would not say, you want me to do what? <laughs> and fortunately, Rick had that one father in a hundred thousand. And he and the, and so he went out and actually studied with Stan Groff because what he realized was um what happened was he was having these difficult experiences with LSD where he felt like he was seeing the flaws of his personality, but that he kept shutting down before he could do anything about it. Right. Yeah. Right. I remember that. Yeah. You yeah. Said that he, he kind of hit a wall. Is he that like what hit a wall, fear. Huh. And he couldn't get past it. And then he read and he thought, well, am I going crazy? Is this nuts? And then he read Stan Groff's book that described the process that Groff had observed about how people, how with therapy, with somebody there helping somebody, that you could get past, that actually that difficulty that he was reading was actually an opportunity. And what it did was it was bringing up his his biggest problems and allowing him to have conscious access to it and to possibly unravel it. But he wasn't able to do that by himself. And so... But suddenly, reading Groff's book, he thought, I'm not crazy. This actually is valuable, and it could be valuable. And I want to learn how to do psychedelic therapy. And, and But first, I want to do it on myself and, and get better, get around that block. So he went out to California, and, he, and just, this is just exactly at the time that they were making LSD as illegal as heroin. And all psychedelics by, um, you know... And, and, tr- and they were trying to make all psychedelics illegal also. And he was thinking, oh, you know, just as I'm discovering this, it, it, they're shutting it down. So what Groff was doing was, you know, Groff took the attitude was, you know what? It's not the drug that's doing the healing. It's the altered state of consciousness that's, that's allowing this healing to happen. And he said, throughout the centuries, humans have found non-drug ways to alter consciousness. And so that's what I need to do is I need to find a, a way that's legal to achieve the same kind of state of altered consciousness. And he came up with this combination of, of sort of hyperventilation and, and loud pounding music that got people into very successfully in, in a lot of cases. It's called um, breath work. And, and so he was using that. And so Rick went out and he learned that he, you know, he learned the principles of how to help people through situations where they're in altered states and having difficult material come up. And, but at the same time, he was going out to the beach without Groff's knowledge and, and doing LSD, et cetera. 
And so then what happened was at one of these retreats, somebody said, you might want to try this. It's MDMA. And, um, and at first he didn't think much of it, but then he took it and he realized that it was a, a state again where, you know, he was sort of put out of himself into an altered state, but there wasn't that, you know, there, there wasn't that fear. It, it almost naturally took that fear away. So he thought this is going to be even more important in therapy than LSD potentially, or at least it's going to serve a, a an important and, and somewhat different purpose, um, especially in, in cases like PTSD, where the big um, uh, blockage to healing is that the traumatic memory that's causing all the problems is repressed. It's, it's too it's repressed because the brain regards it as too threatening, too frightening to go near there. Yeah. But because MDMA lowers that fear, it allows people to approach that memory, which they have to do to get over it, and without the, the sort of panic reaction that causes all their symptoms. Um, and the other advantage was, this was um, in, in the early 80s, and uh, MDMA was kind of a new drug to the regulatory people, so it wasn't yet illegal. <laughs> Yeah. So he and he they all knew it was going to be. But, you know, he felt like now we have a number of years. So, of course, Rick, <laughs> he got in touch with a, a, a high up at the U.N. who had written a book about how, you know, there was some kind of there needed to be some kind of world spirituality in order to get around all this war that we keep having. And Rick thought, well, you know, I agree with your book but you didn't mention psychedelic drugs. And I think that's an important thing. And so unbelievably, the guy writes back and says, you know, you make a good point. And I think there are others who would like to uh, hear from you. And he listed some spiritual leaders in different faiths. Wink, and, nudge, nudge. <laughs> and so Rick, and Rick took that as saying, he wants me to send them MDMA. And he did. So he sent MDMA to like you know these these world renowned uh, religious figures, and some of them actually did it, and and they said this is really valuable, and so they were making statements like that right about the time that the government was going to make this illegal, and um, and so Rick sort of just by the sheer force of his intent, <laughs> yeah, insinuated himself in this in in this uh, sort of culture of people who had been important in the psychedelic movement of the 50s and 60s and they were kind of connected at Esalon in California and Rick just kind of insinuated himself that and he kind of said we've got to fight this you know we can't just let them make this illegal because it says in the law that if if the drug has a a um, recognized medical value, it cannot be placed on Schedule One. And he says, we've been, you know, there have been um, therapists who've been using this successfully for years. Everybody knows that this has a, an accepted medical purpose, and so we've got to fight this. And he ended up leading this charge um, to when the DEA said that they were going to put MDMA on Schedule One, and uh, he. And he sort of got all these, um, all these psychiatrists and therapists to write these letters to the DA protesting. So they had a year-long hearing in which the DA brought all their evidence against, against MDMA. And um, Rick and his colleagues sort of got the evidence for it. And on every point, the judge ruled for Rick and his colleagues said MDMA definitely has accepted medical use. It's not highly addictive and it's and it's not dangerous when given under medical supervision. And just down the line, it was a slam dunk. Unfortunately, it was an administrative hearing, not a, uh, a court hearing. And so the DEA said, sorry, we reject the judge. And in fact, the DEA even called the judge biased 
which they later apologized for. But anyway, they, you know, they they just said it's our football, so we're taking it and going home. Very interesting. So, so MDMA became illegal, and at that point, some of the people that Rick had been working with said, well, we either have to just drop it or go underground. But yeah, Rick refused yeah. to do that, and he, and he founded MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and he made it his mission, and people thought he was crazy. I mean, some people still think he's crazy, but, <laughs> but he actually made this work. And it took him 15 years to really get the first FDA-approved clinical study of MDMA off the ground. And that's where the third person in my book, Michael Minhofer, comes in. He was a psychiatrist who had, um, had really become interested in the power of altered states in, in, in psychological healing to the point where he went down to Peru and spent uh, a week or 10 days doing ayahuasca with a shaman. Um, and he came back and he wanted, to, he, he felt he was going to have to go out of the country somewhere to do this research. And meanwhile, Rick couldn't find a psychiatrist who would, who would even put his name to this research because they, it was too punishing. I mean, people would destroy their careers by even suggesting that psychedelics might not be this evil poison. Um, so when Michael Midhofer came up to Rick at a conference and said, I'd like to do this research on, on using psychedelics for therapy, what country do you think I can do it in? Rick was saying, are you a psychiatrist? And he said, yes. And Rick said, you can do it here and, you're gonna, and I'm gonna help you. So that sort of became their team. And the third person, in acid tests that I follow is a Marine um, who Nicholas, right? Nicholas Blackston. And he, you know, he, he joined the Marines in time to go to Iraq. He had these horrific combat experiences where he both had to watch his friends get sort of gut shot and bleed out in front of him, as well as, you know, shoot at kids like 12, 14 year old kids who somebody had given an AK 47 and told to shoot at the Americans. And he had to like sit there on his 50 caliber machine gun, blowing away these children. Wow. Which he felt horribly guilty for, of course. And he felt guilty for not being able to save his friends. So it was a real mess. And he was injured himself. And he came back with really terrible PTSD and to the point where. He really thought he wasn't going to survive, that he couldn't stand it. He was going to have to kill himself. And that's when he read about these first studies that they were doing um, to treat it with uh, MDMA. And he and basically the the climax of the book is when he gets the therapy himself. Right. Did you have an extensive time with uh, Rick Doblin as a, as a result of the research on this? Or what was that like? <laughs> Well, it's very funny. My my history with Rick Doblin is is uh, very synchronistic. Um, I, I was a uh, it, it goes all the way back to 1975 when I was a student journalist at the University of Florida. I was the editor of the college newspaper there, and I grew up in Sarasota, so I was home for spring break, and there was like a little blurb in the local paper about this hippie out in the woods building this magnificent house. I mean, it was like these huge cedar beams and stained glass windows and, and river rock floor. I mean, it was really spectacular. And so, and I recognized when in his philosophy, you know, I'd had um, some experience with psychedelics in college. You know, I, it was in Gainesville, Florida, and they had these cow pastures out there. And in the cow's pastures, through the psilocybin mushrooms. So we'd go out into the pastures, sneak under the fences, and grab the mushrooms right out of the cow dung. And, you know, we'd either boil them or eat them. And, you know, and I didn't do this frivolously. I was seeking. You know, I knew from the very first experience, I knew that this was something important and something big. And I had certain experiences that I, that, you know, when the drugs wore off, 
they were every bit as valuable as I thought they were when that when it was happening. And just as an example, there was one time where I, I did the mushrooms and I started obsessing about anxieties and concerns that I had. And then that kept building. So it was like so I was worried about something that was happening that day. And then I started worrying about the future. And I, and it was like this enormous weight and I could feel it like it was a real boulder or something on my chest. And I had this vision suddenly, you know, it just got worse and worse to the point where I could barely breathe. And then I suddenly had this breakthrough vision where I saw that it was a boulder. Yeah. But the reason it was on my chest was I was holding it to myself with my own arms that I was actually choosing to hold that boulder there. And all I had to do was let my arms go and the boulder would drop away. And I did. And all the anxieties and worries disappeared. And so the rest of my life since then, really, I've known that that was a possibility. And I've understood that to a certain extent, all negative feelings and emotions that you have are choice. You're choosing to feel them to, to an extent. And that if you can somehow develop the muscle, you're able to let them go. Incredibly valuable thing that I never would have gotten to be, if I hadn't had this vision because you know, on the in the psilocybin experience, it's not just an intellectual thought. You're not just thinking, oh, well, maybe I'm choosing to on something. You're actually feeling and seeing it in in a very concrete way. Uh, uh, you know, so that I, I actually could let the boulder go and feel it fall away. Um, so I I knew that it was valuable, and I knew that from the things Rick was saying that what he was really saying was he was trying to take the things he'd learn in, in, the, in, the, in the psychedelic uh, experience and put them into literally into concrete by building this house. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I went, to, I went down there and I did a story on him for the Sunday supplement of the college newspaper. And that was in 1975. And then I went about my business. And when I got out of college, you know, I got a career, I got a family. Um, there weren't cow pastures around. So I, you know, for all the, and they were still illegal. So I stopped doing the psychedelics. I didn't do them anymore, but I still remembered their value. And then I was 10 years later, I was the editor of the Miami Herald Sunday magazine. And, um, I saw a little blurb in the Tampa paper that there was a sort of wild, wild man hippie who was proclaiming that this new drug, this new psychedelic MDMA was the magic silver bullet in psychiatry and in psychotherapy. And I was reading it and I thought, Rick Doblin, that's the hippie in the woods. That's the same guy. (laughs) So I assigned a reporter and we went to go and do a cover story on this. And I think we called it, I think the headline was a Timothy Leary for the 80s. So then another 15 years go by and uh, and I am now ed- or 18 years I guess and I'm now editor of the um, Washington Post magazine and I see a little blurb in the New York Times about how Harvard is doing the first uh, clinical study of psychedelics since they rode Tim Leary out of town on a rail and as I'm reading further, it turns out that it's being sponsored by this organization called MAPS and that the founder and director of the organization is a, a guy named Rick Doblin. And I said, wait a second, I this is the same guy. So I said, this time I'm going to do a story on it. And I called him on the phone and he not only remembered who I was, he said, I have the story you wrote for your college paper. And the story you wrote from the Miami Herald Sunday Magazine on my desk right now, because just this morning I was showing them to my board of directors. And what he was trying to do was make the point that he had come a long way in his image from this wild man, Tim Leary character to somebody who was able to successfully deal with, you know, the most important and conservative institutions in the country, like, you know, Harvard McLean Psychiatric Hospital. Right. Which was great, except that it wasn't entirely true because the McLean Hospital changed leadership and the new president um, said, uh, 
I, we don't want anything to do with Rick Doblin. That guy's a crazy hippie. <laughs> and so they said, we're not going to accept money from maps. Basically, I mean, it's a long story, but basically that study never really got off the ground. But at the same time, he had done this work with Michael Midhofer, and, and, and Midhofer was, had just started a study in South Carolina where they were using MDMA to treat uh, mostly women, victims of rape and sexual abuse. So I went down there, and I was so impressed with what I saw that I knew that I wanted to write a book about this. But I also knew that you know publishers might, you know, might look at this a little wearily, and um, and so I knew that at the time the Iraq War had already started, and already we were beginning to see an unbelievably high percent, as many as twenty percent of people who served in Iraq were coming home with PTSD. And it was clear this was gonna be an immense problem. And so, and I knew that Michael and Rick were planning to do, their next study was gonna be veterans with combat related PTSD. And I said, that's the thing that will get people to take this seriously because everybody's aware and feels, I think, guilty that we're sending these people, these young people to serve us and they're coming home this badly injured and wounded yeah and uh so i had to wait for that to happen and then i also had to wait a certain amount of time after the therapy before i could even talk to these people and then i had to find somebody who was willing to reveal all their most intimate you know dark and scary secrets uh that they were like talking about under the influence of the psychedelic drug and to do it completely fully with their name and everything Unfortunately, that's that's when I found Nick Blackston, who was so moved by how this had helped him and so guilty that he was leaving his comrades sort of behind where they couldn't have access to this, that he decided he was willing to put himself out there. He thought maybe it would help advance the therapy. Hmm. Very, very interesting stuff. I mean, I definitely... I, I I feel like you you spent some time covering ayahuasca and DMT and and so I feel like I feel like across the spectrum of psychedelics there is this sort of breakthrough that happens and we're able to somehow connect with I mean how would you term it how would you term that that moment I I know that it you said that it allows you to kind of see reality for for what it is but I mean, all these drugs that are illegal are now helping all these people. Now, why are they? I mean, why are you know? It's, why are I they mean, still illegal? They've been helping people for thousands of years. Is the is the truth? I mean, this has been used in in healing and in spiritual development uh, in almost every other culture around the world. Um, you know, and even in Western culture, and you know, in the the ancient. Uh, you know, in the ancient times, they had these ecstatic visions, and, and people think that, yes, they, they were some kind of psychedelic drug that they were using. Um, so it's, it's new to us as in our materialistic sort of science-based Western culture, but it's not new to the world. And I think that all these drugs, you know, have in common is that it's it's about the experience. It's not about the drug, really. It's about the experience that the drug helps bring about. Hmm. Dr. G, you want to add something to that? I definitely, I mean, from my personal experiences in that realm, that seems to be the case. Um, when do you anticipate MDMA actually being a prescription drug? Well, I, I, that, I mean, that's a, a thing that's really um, important to focus on. I think that given the fact that there are all these phase two trials going on um, and they're all having, you know, you can't, you're never supposed to predict the success of ongoing studies. But remember this, they had almost 20 years of, of successful use of these drugs in the fifties and sixties. So it's not really, I'm not really, it's not really all that suspenseful to me. You know, as one of the researchers said, we know this works. You know, we're not trying to discover whether it works. We know this works. We're just trying to prove it in a way that 
the mainstream will accept. And, and that's going to happen. But the problem is that the phase three trials, which are required before it becomes a prescription drug, it involves hundreds of subjects. It has to be done in like a dozen different locations. It costs tens of millions of dollars. And meanwhile, MAPS is this little like nonprofit and they're, they're raising money in like fives and tens and twenties on Indiegogo campaigns and stuff. So it's going to really stretch this out. And Rick is like, you know, forecasting in, in like under 10 years, but I don't, every forecast he's made has been incredibly overly optimistic. And at the rate they're going, I wouldn't be surprised if it would take 15 years before this is a prescription drug. That is too long to wait. That's way too, yeah. And, and the really tragic thing is that there are about, there are as many as half a million vets coming home who are going to have lifelong PTSD without appropriate treatment, without treatment that's going to really help them get to the root of it. And this is going to cost us in disability and medical treatment, uh, you know, that we owe these vets. The, the estimate is that it's going to cost us like a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. That's, isn't like Canada, Canada has more suicides than deaths for their army now? And, and they're now, and plus 22 vets a day are successfully committing suicide. Twice that many are attempting it. Um, and a significant portion of that is related to unresolved PTSD. So um, you would think that the Pentagon, which has, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar budget, um, you know, the, 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 you know, what I always say is they have enough change in their couch cushions to fund this research and move it along quickly. But so far, they have not contributed a single dime. And why is that? It's because of this lingering stigma that LSD is somehow like a demon drug or that psychedelics are weird or, or you know, about, you know, or it's, it's about some kind you don't, of... You don't think that they're making money through these ph pharmaceutical companies no 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 the um you mean the, the well nobody's going to make money on psychedelics because it's you can't, can't patent. patent yeah and because unlike other drugs that are given in psychiatry you don't have to keep giving it over somebody's right. lifetime right. you give you do a therapy over a handful of times and the problems are resolved you know, maybe you need to come back once every three so years. Maybe that's maybe that's why it's still legal, is because it well, actually so works. That's why that's why they're not getting investors because there's no money to be made in this, really. Yeah. So you know, they're not really getting investors to do it. So that really means that you know the and plus the FDA could declare this an urgent need, and fast track all these incredibly time consuming um, trials that they're doing. But they're not doing that, and the and the government is not contributing a dime to this. And you know, I was I went on an NPR show, the Diane Reem show, um, and I was trying to find somebody from the Pentagon to go on to discuss this with me. And I had a uh, contact in there in in the military, and he communicated with someone who would have been appropriate. And he showed me the email that he got back, and the guy says, "Oh no." This is much too dangerous for folks in uniform to talk about this. And that just drove me crazy because, you know, it's dangerous to talk about it. You know, leaving half a million vets with severe PTSD untreated is not dangerous, but it's dangerous to discuss even the possibility that this might be an effective therapy. You know, it really is, is insane. But it's it's almost sick, it's sickening. Like, doesn't there seem to be some kind of almost global consciousness shift where enough people are actually, I mean, because of podcasts, because of access information, because the internet are starting to recognize that, you know, these are valid forms of not even just psychotherapy. These are, these are almost in like even ayahuasca, you know, these are inalienable rights. Like being able to control your consciousness is a, is a distinct human right. And what's it going to take? You know, we go through these shifts like the 60s had it, and now there seems to be this other uprising right now. How, you know, is this going to be the next wave when people uh, kind of 
tell the government to go screw themselves? Like, how long is this going to keep going on until? Well, we I mean, I mean, certainly there are a lot of people who do it illegally, um, but I don't want to do it illegally. I want to do it legally. <laughs> but that, you know, that, you know, that's another question because um, this is, I mean. To be honest, this is not just something that is important for people with, you know, known psychiatric conditions. Um, Johns Hopkins did a study where they gave psilocybin to normal, completely healthy individuals who'd never done psychedelics before. And 70% of them at the end said, described it as one of the um, five most significant experiences of their lives. These are just normal people without any any presenting problems. Um, so that suggests that it has value. I mean, if it's one of the five most significant experiences in their lives, and, and then like 30% said it was the single most significant experience of their life. And this is taking a high dose of psilocybin in a, you know, basically in a, in a, la in a office lounge. Um, so obviously this has some value for in in terms of personality development and 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 life satisfaction um that could be of real help to almost anybody um but that's a whole different thing because you know the the, the course that they're on now is by within the medical establishment proving that it is an effective therapy for a given condition that's the track they're on they're going to get there. It shouldn't take 15 years, but it might because, the, you know, nobody's kicking in with the big government money to hurry this along because of the urgent need. But the use of it, you know, there are people concerned about saying, well, look, um, there's this guy named Bob Jesse who, who founded something called the Council on Spiritual Practices. And he said, look, I don't I, I, I want to know what will it take so that. These drugs can be judiciously used for people to have religious experiences, to have primary religious experiences. Um, and, you know, there's not really an answer to that question yet. I mean, you know, you see what's happening with marijuana, where at first it became approved for medical uses, and now a lot of states are legalizing it. Um, I think that psychedelics even have a bigger stigma than marijuana has had. Um, you know, because the experience is, is so powerful. I think that people find that frightening. It's almost like, you know, the, the first time Hoffman took it, when he didn't know what it was going to do, he was afraid it was driving him, it was going to make him go crazy. And I think that people who don't understand it see the, you know, the size of the experience and think, oh, it's about making people go insane. Reefer madness. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's a different question about can it ever be sort of integrated into our society? I mean, there are approved religions who legally can use ayahuasca or in the case of the Native American church, peyote and mescaline um, as part of their religious observance. Right. So, I mean, you know, maybe there'll be churches that pop up which have that right and you join the church and you know that's what Leary was trying to do. They had a, they had a, they tried to like in, institute this idea of a church that used psychedelics as sacrament. Do you, do you think there's almost like an agenda behind it that they don't want people having access, whoever they is, perhaps the government doesn't want people having access to these higher realms of consciousness because of some form of understanding or whatever access that they get in these realms? No, no, I think they just don't understand them, and they just lump them in with, um, you know, all, all sorts of um, other things that have caused problems in society like heroin or alcohol um, and, and, th and think, you know, they think that they're similarly that they're like, you know, a lot of people think, and even on some comments, you know, when excerpts of the book have run in various places and some people say, you know, how crazy is it to think that, you know, these people who have these problems can solve them by escaping reality. See, that's what they think is that this is mm -hmm. that these drugs create an imaginary world, you know, a world, a false image of the world, and that it's an escape from reality. 
And, um, you know, one of the original researchers who was using it to treat alcoholism was saying, no, it's a, it's an a burgeoning of reality, an enhancement in, 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 of it, a closer encounter with it. Um, but so, the, re- the research says that LSD is non-toxic, not addictive, right? Well, yeah, yes. I mean, it's it's well, some in in the again in like 1960, uh, a, a psychiatrist did a survey of all the research that had been done, the thousands of doses that had been administered, and said that for such a powerful psychoactive drug, it was it was remarkably safe. Um, you know, it does have some dangers. Uh, there, there's, there's a syndrome that sometimes happens, rarely happens, where you, you have this altered visual perception that lingers after the drug, that persists. Um, certainly, uncontrolled use can be dangerous because people have these anxiety reactions to it. Um, if they don't have somebody... In a, you know, to prepare them for the experience. That's why set and setting has always been seen as so important. Somebody who goes into it with understanding what the experience is going to be like, their intent is to, you know, is to sort of use this for personal exploration. They have somebody there who's protecting them from the outside world as they're doing this. And um, also, to kind of reassure them if they get into one of these anxiety reactions. But people have needed um, hospitalization as a result of this when those conditions haven't been met. So, you know, there are, this is not something to be done lightly or casually or in any kind of situations that aren't highly controlled. Yeah. We had a, uh, one of our rotation, one of our psychiatry rotations that we had, I think you're referring to HPPD, the hallucinogen persistent, or yes. disorder. Uh, I think there was, I don't want to give away, you know, any information about this patient, but he, he did acid, I think like over a hundred times <clears throat> and we were interviewing him and he just kept having these like hallucinations. And I remember he, we were asking, he's like, what do you see? And he's like, there's just demons like all over. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> he's like, he's, they're all over you. Well, right that's now. not the, <laughs> we that's just, not the visual distortions. That sounds like psychosis to me. And that's the other thing is that people who aren't properly screened, people who have um, a history of mental illness could have their mental illness sort of exasperated by the psychedelic experience. So, that, you know, that's another danger of it is people, people who have um, this pre-existing issues with mental health and psychosis, et cetera, um, that's certainly not advisable for them to be doing psychedelic drugs. And it sounds like this guy certainly had a psych- active psychosis ongoing there. He was, a, I mean, he, he, he played along well. I mean, he was a great guy. It's just, I feel bad for him. There's just demons and angels apparently. Yeah, well, it's no room. fun being psychotic, that's for sure. Well, I, I, just, I just think that, you know, people need to get involved and to sort of say, look, this is, this is incredibly important and promising research. And, you know, we not only don't want to get in the way of it, but, you know, our, the, the institutions that are responsible for all these men and women who are coming back from wars they were fighting on our behalf, uh, severely wounded and with this persistent PTSD, and they need to get it together and, and get this research completed as quickly as possible to get these really promising treatments out there and available to whoever needs them. There are millions of people out there, not just vets, but millions of people with all kinds of, um, of psychiatric difficulties that could be helped by this therapy. Right. Tom, I got a quick question. Um, do you have any advice for any aspiring writers out there? Uh, you're, I was reading some stuff on your website, and it, it resonates. I was reading uh, Stephen King's On Writing. What, uh, just what are some things that you would, you would recommend to some people that are interested in writing? Well, I, I mean, the, the thing that, that I discovered was um, I, I, I wanted to be a writer. I was interested in writing fiction um, when I was in college, and uh, 
so I thought about it a lot. And then I suddenly realized, you know, there's one thing missing here. I'm not actually writing anything unless I have a deadline. I mean, I'd write a story if I had a class and I'd wait until the deadline and then I'd suddenly get it done. But when I didn't have a class, I didn't write a story. So I decided, well, I need to put myself in a situation where I have lots of deadlines. So that's when I joined the college paper. So, I mean, the first thing you got to do is you got to write. If you want to be a writer, you have to write. Is it Parkinson's Law? Or <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then, you know, I think that you really have to think about what is it that I have to say that's original and that's meaningful. Um, and so, I, you know, it's not really about the writing. It's about what it is that you're communicating. So instead of, you know, just this idea that you're just pushing out all these words, it's really what you're really trying to do is you're trying to understand something well enough so that you have something valuable to say about it. Then it becomes an issue of trying to say that as economically and as powerfully as possible. But the first thing is to have something really important to say. So I think that, you know, I think that anybody who wants to be a writer needs to think about what it is that I, I have would be interesting to other people and important for them to, to learn about that I know. Huh. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, so Tom, I know you're pressed for time. Uh, where can people find your work? What are you up to right now? Well, I, I am, I, you know, right now I'm still doing a lot of uh, things like this, talking about acid tests, which, you know, I'm certainly willing to do whatever it takes to promote that because I think it's important, you know, that people get this um, perspective where they understand where these people who are doing this research and where these drugs are coming from um, to understand the whole history, the whole thinking behind it, the personalities behind it. These aren't crazies. These are very smart, dedicated, accomplished people who have led exemplary lives. Um, so I want, you know, I, I definitely want people to understand that and to also to understand that uh, this isn't some weird process by which the drug works that you can actually it's very transparent in that you can see the people sort of having these insights very consciously that solve their problems um so you know so that's important to me i am working on another book and as you as you pointed out from my website i'm in that festival of self-loathing right now oh yeah it That's seems what I've been like doing it. all day today, um, <laughs> but I'm you know I'm I'm forging forward. It's it's about you know I'm I'm 60 now, and I think that a lot of people reach an age where you know maybe they've been ignoring their family roots most of their lives, but then you suddenly reach an age where you suddenly start wondering about them, and very often it's when everybody who could possibly have told you about them firsthand is dead. Um, but in my case, um, my grandfather was a writer. And so that gives me a particular connection with him. I never credited him with making me want to become a writer. But now that I think about it, it seems like maybe there was something to that. But unlike most people who suddenly get curious about dead relatives with nobody to ask about them, nobody on the face of the planet who can really this information is just lost forever. But I have this unique situation where, because uh, my grandfather's letters and papers and all his manuscripts and articles about him from you know the 20s onward are all stored in these a series of like 180 boxes at the Library of Congress, which I've never looked at. And so, this book is about me going through and looking through all that stuff and, you know, what it is I learn about him and myself. And also it's going to be about the science of why do we care about our ancestors in the first place? So that's, that's what I'm going to be spending the next couple of years of my life messing around with. Cool. That sounds awesome. interesting. We'll look forward to that. Is there is there a place people can find what, you, what you're doing right now? Is it well, my, my, Yeah, I keep my... Um, there's an acid test Facebook page 
that sort of keeps people updated on what's going on with acid tests like this podcast and whatever. Um, and also I have a website, tomschroeder.com, uh, in which I, uh, you know, I talk about writing and I talk about what I'm up to, et cetera. Very cool. So, uh, this has been the, the human experience. I'm Xavier, Dr. G, you got anything else to say, man? No, thanks. Thanks, Tom. That was a, that was a pleasure. Yeah, it's been great talking to you guys. Thank you for thank having you me. So, thank you so much for being here with us. Tom. All right.